I have a couple of gentlemen here, and I'm going to bring Al up, and I'm going to turn the mic over to him, and um, I'm sure he, uh, he'll open it up to you for questions and answers later. But um, welcome aboard, Al. Thank you. Yeah, I, see, everybody's got their fancy hat, so I dug this one out of the basement. So I don't know if I should wear it while I'm talking. But, you know, we all have, we all have, this is what we were issued. Um, I, I really didn't expect to give much of a talk here. When I called into the museum to find out the schedule uh, early this week or end of last week, they said, oh, we might have you talk to some people a little bit just so, you know, get your idea on things. So I'm just going to be kind of extemporaneous here. Um, I arrived in Anahuitoc in December of 78 and left in May of 79. During that time, we were taking between 6 inches and 18 inches of soil off of the other islands. Now, um, when I got there, Lodge was built out. There were about 250, 300 folks on that island. And then we all went from there to work on our respective islands. Um, now, on our island, we had A Company, B Company, and Holmes and & Narver, and Holmes and & Narver provided all the services to us. And A Company ran Runit, and B Company went to the other islands. So B Company went to the other islands, they scraped the soil off of those islands, loaded them onto either LCU, LCM boats, and I think the larks were used occasionally as well, the, the amphibious craft, and they just dumped the soil onto the boats and then bring it out to Runit where we would offload it and put it into a bomb blast crater. Now, how we did that was first we would take it to a shaker box, and we'd take it and dump it into the shaker box. And the shaker box, the whole purpose of it was it had a sieve in it, and it would uh, filter it based to get the, the big stuff out, to get the, the metal out, to get the big rocks out. So we just had sand and rocks and then debris. And the only one thing that really happened that was kind of funny, and again, I'm extemporaneous, so if I'm boring you, just close your eyes and, and then I'll know I need to stop talking. Um, but one time, the guys who were running the shaker box, and they've, they've got the full yellow suits on and the, the, the breather system, and the guy's bringing the bucket loader and dumping it over the shaker box, and they're scooping it all out. And they look down, and there's a landmine in, in the shaker box, and it's shaking it away <laughs> like crazy. And... To see those two guys run was amazing. <laughs> they took off. We shut down the shaker box, called in the Air Force, and we, we disposed of it. Um, and, but we were always having landmines wash up on shore, finding uh, landmines when we were, or sea mine, ocean mines wash up on shore, or finding landmines or grenades or unexploded ordnance as we were digging up the islands because it was the site of a, a big uh, World War II campaign against the Japanese. Um, and in fact, another side note, one time when scuba diving, we found a Japanese Zero in the water. And uh, I know some other guys said they found a tank that was covered with uh, coral. But underneath it was a tank that had sunk during uh, when it was being transported between a couple of the islands. So anyway, now what we did, once we, uh, back to the soil, what we did was we took the soil and we put it, now let me back up a little bit. We buried the stuff in a bomb blast crater that was uh, from the cactus blast. It was approximately 365 feet in diameter and about 35 feet deep. So we took the soil and we mixed it with Portland cement in a concrete plant, put it in concrete transit trucks and drove it to the crater and then had concrete pumps that would pump it out to the center uh, to a little raft we had out there with a crane and the, and the, the pipe for the concrete pump went over the and then down into the water, and we tried to position it so it was about a foot or so off the bottom of the bomb blast crater. Um, and so we'd pump it up, and we'd move the little raft around and all that, and we did that until we filled it in completely. At that point, we were then above sea level. From then, we changed tactic a little bit, and we went to uh, making soil cement, where we would take the soil and spread it out, and then take bags of Portland cement and throw it onto it, and then run a disc harrow over it, and in order to turn it, you know, till it together, and then uh, water it and roll it until we had a nice tight pack on it. We left the center empty, and that's where we threw all our debris. So we threw all our uh, radioactive metals in there, uh, any plutonium. We, every now and then we'd come across some plutonium uh, that get thrown in there, and finally one, we built it all up. And 
We built a, a concrete wall around the perimeter, and it was a, about an 18-inch thick wall. And, and again, let me divert to another funny story that happened there. Um, a lot of the brass from Hawaii would come out to Hawaii, uh, out to Anawitak, rather, and just spend, I think they had to spend one week there, and then they got their humanitarian service award. So we had a lot of generals and colonels that used to like to come out and get briefed so that they could get their medal. Um, one time we're sitting there and working, and, and we're putting this perimeter wall up, and we kept being told, you know, how, how big do we need to make this? You know, are we gonna, and they said, don't worry about it, just get this wall in, and if we have more soil than we're expecting, we'll just go ahead and we'll, you know, tear some out and we'll extend it and make a big goose egg until it's big enough. So, fine. So we knew it wasn't that important to, you know, to just get it put in. So one of our, I think he was a two-star, decided to come out and get his medal, and he flew over the crater, and the next thing we know, we get the word, it's not round. <laughs> okay, so what do we do? So we spent a lot of time in helicopters and taking pictures, and we saw that what was happening in the wall, is sometimes we'd get a little too straight, and then we'd kink it over to go the next direction. So we decided at that point that we would just take the kinks out and just kind of round the kinks. Then we surveyed it to figure out ex the exact position of the wall. Now, I went in the Army, I was in the Corps of Engineers, right? I, you know, gung-ho, combat engineer, explosives, all, all that kind of stuff. But in college, my background, I had a double major in physics and computer science. And so the DOE guy, or the De Defense Nuclear Agency guys, had a computer. And we were able to get all of the coordinates onto the computer system and figure out exactly how to make the wall so that we took the kinks out. But the next problem is, is when we were done, it was goose egg shaped. It wasn't round. So what do we do about it? Now, the original wall, uh, concrete cap that was going over, once we got it built up, then we needed to put concrete on. We're supposed to put 20 by 20 sections for three rows, then 10 by 10s, then 5 by 5s, and then put the, 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 the end cap on it. So we said, well, let's make it look round by the end of the third 20-foot ring. So again, I sat down with the Defense Nuclear Agency's guy's computer, and if you were to go out there as a surveyor today and look at it, those 20 by 20 slabs go into as little as 18 by 18 and out as much by 26 by 26. And they just gradually in and out until by the time we got inside the third 20 by 20 ring, we were then round. And nobody ever noticed. I mean, it was phenomenal. And, and <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, one of the things I take great pride in is I, I left when we had about two rows of the rings in, I think, about that. And as one of my final tasks there, I put together a loose leaf binder and page protectors of the size and position of every slab that should go there. And I left it with my replacement, and he kept it on Runet Island. The people, the, the colonel and major, the battalion commander and S3 called down, uh, called up to our island one time, and they talked to Scott Mansfield, who was my replacement, and said, send the book down. And we want to take a look at it and see what it's like. At which point, he said, the hell, I'm not sending you the book. If you want to see it, you come up here. If we lose that book, we're in trouble. <laughs> so, so needless to say, the colonel and the major made their trip up to Runa to look at the book because, you know, First Lieutenant Scott Mansfield wouldn't let it leave the island. So, so that was, that. I got a little pride in that. But anyway, back to what we, we really did. We, uh, well, again, we covered it all with concrete. Um, the, the wall was 18 inches thick, varied in size, as I, I said, and, and we covered it. Um, I, I was gone while they're still under construction. From what I understand, and I, I never quite got a clear story, all of the equipment, I heard one rumor that they decided that it was too damaged from salt, the salt spray, that it wasn't worth sending back to Hawaii. Another rumor I heard was that the union that unloads ships wouldn't unload it. And so basically everything we had out there, they dumped into the center of the lagoon. So we had, you know, the, the, the conveyors, the concrete transit trucks, the dump trucks, the bucket loaders, everything just went into the lagoon. And it's now natural habitat. So, you know, because it's all covered with coral by now. Um, the neat things about it, we got to scuba dive every Sunday. Um, 
the Army had a, a, a scuba-style air pump in Anahuitac, and we'd send our tanks down there, and they'd come back a couple days later, and so we were scuba diving every Sunday, so that was kind of cool. Um, got a lot of gray reef sharks out there, a lot of interesting, uh, you know, biology in the water. Um, you know, uh, I guess the other thing that I, I don't want to go into too many war stories here, but because of the way the tax system works, it turns out that beer is cheaper than Coke. <laughs> so we had all the only beer we could get. I think it was about 20 cents a can. Do you remember? Wasn't it about 20 cents a can? Something like that. Saturday nights, they used to refer to them as Saturday Night Live. And the homes in Arbor, would supply, we had um, uh, barbecue grills made out of 55 gallon drums and Holmes and Arbor would give us cases of steaks and then so every Saturday night, because we work five and a half days a week, every Saturday night was all the ole and steak you could, you could deal with. And so that was always good and there's lots of stories associated with that. Um, is there anything else either you guys can think of? Yes. I'd like to ask you a question. You say that uh, you threw plutonium in the center. Yes. What plutonium, uh, what was it? Uh, I don't know exactly. The, what I was told is it was uh, remnants of plutonium that from uh, tests that didn't go right. And I don't know all the details. They were just, I was just told it's plutonium that was. So did you see it as, as, a, as an oxide or, or did, you, did you? I never saw it. Okay, I, I didn't handle it. I, you know, I was in the office about half the time, and I just I didn't want to go out there, to be honest with you. Um, but it, it didn't happen much when we'd have it, so, so I can't comment. Um, let's see. Did you ever have any organs blow up, like your landmines or grenades or anything? No, we, we never had any that blew up. Everything we had, we blew up in place. Now, there was the Air Force had a bomb disposal unit there, and. So we had landmines or sea mines come ashore one time, and the Air Force decided to blow it in place, and one guy prepared the caps and another guy prepared the charges, and the two of them didn't work well together, I guess, and they didn't put the caps inside the explosives. So um, if you're familiar with explosives at all, when you have a charge that doesn't go on, off, you've got to, you've got to wonder, did the cap fail or did I make a mistake? So you have to wait 45 minutes before you can do anything. So we decided the heck with that. We, were, we had to blast the reef rock in order to create rock. So we had a, a rock crusher out there. And I don't know, were you out there when we did that? OK, so that was after you. We, we had these drill bits, and we drill into the coral. And I, I wish I could remember the name of the explosive. It, it, it's escaping me. But it's, it's from DuPont. It was a blue jelly. And they put it in a plastic tube about that big around and that long. And we'd poke holes in it and stick the blasting caps in it and, and with fuse. And we would drill holes into the coral and then drop these charges into it. Could be ETM by any chance? It could be. I just don't remember. It was a few years ago. Um, and then so we'd blast it and we'd take the coral and we'd dig it up and we'd throw it in the rock crusher. And then that's what we made the concrete on the cap out of. Um, so we were, we were blasting all the time. So we thought it was kind of silly to bring the Air Force out there and have this little keystone cop maneuver. So after that, we went and had and just blew our own stuff up. So we blew up a couple landmines. We blew up a handful of sea mines every now and then. You know, as I told you, put the, they dumped the thing into uh, the dirt into the shaker box and it, to be screened. Uh, there was a, one time we had a grenade in there, I believe, and you know that kind of stuff. And so we we just blast it in place, and uh, you know you'd get a big boom. And how much was ours, and how much was you know there. I don't know, but we never had anything go off unintentionally. So, yes, sir. I'm going to go back to the plutonium. Yeah. Um, was that for <coughs> Who was figuring out that it was plutonium and how it was being picked up? Hey, you know, it was my job to, to listen to it, and they told me it's plutonium, and we just buried it. I don't really know. Um, you know. I'm just a, you know, at the time, you've got to figure the company commander is about 25. I'm the first lieutenant. I'm the number two on the island. I'm about 23. You know, we're, we're not exactly seasoned veterans. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, sir. Can you talk about Ireland and any way talk? Can you clean this island? Will the island, is part of any way talk at all? Or will the island be clean? Okay. Um, 
play yards or that type of Gosh, I, I, you know, I'm not really sure the size of them. The blasts were all done uh, from the eastern side up through the north, and Anawitak was a, the Anawitak Island in the atoll was the southern part, and that's where headquarters was. That's where the main air uh, runway was, and all that sort of stuff. Um, in terms of how big, you know, I, there were like, what about eight islands, ten islands? I think we, we skimmed the soil off of, but I just don't remember the sizes. Yeah. Of them. Uh, well, Lojwa that we lived on was 44 acres, and that was probably comparable in size to a lot of the islands. Runit, where we buried it, was about a mile and a half long by, I uh, don't know, 100 or 200 yards wide. I mean, they were all little islands. Yeah, yeah. there were a series of, it's, you know, the whole Bikini Atoll, or Anawitok, is a series of just small islands in a circle. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I can hear that uh, Holmes and Ira was feeding good again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And um, I have to tell you, on, and you probably stayed on probably the island that had the runway. No, no well, you stayed on Elmer then. No, three no, miles the, over. No, the, no, the, we we stayed on Lojwa, which was up in the northeastern. Oh, corner. okay. All and right. And that's we're all the people that handled the soil and all yeah. that stuff. Okay. Headquarters was down on Anawitak on the Anawitak. bottom side. Okay. And that's where the long runway was. Now, during World War II, Runit had a small runway as well. Yes, it did. Um, but by the time we were there, the runway was gone. Oh, yeah. there, there was a little like peninsula, like where the runway was, mm -hmm. but it, it was gone. And I don't know whether yeah. it was ever paved or whatever. Well, the big island that had the runway was uh, basically what we called uh, Fred. Okay. And then about three miles away, we had the African Queen, uh, which we called the vessel to take the people over from one island to the other. And most of us in Holmes and Arbor and Atomic Energy Commission, and or naturally we would have some laboratory people there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, yeah, we had over 3,000 people on the island. Wow. Yeah, I, I think the island was a half a mile wide and one and a half miles long. Okay, and, and that uh, was down on the and we talked Fred. Yeah, that's that down bottom. on the southern yeah. edge. I want to say, is that right, southern? Yeah, at the bottom. Yeah. And uh, you know. I went out there in uh, December of 55. Uh, I didn't come back out of there until uh, 58, January or February of 58. Uh, spent a lot of time out there. Um, I didn't really get involved in day-to-day -day activities out in the field. I was a, one of the administrative officers and then to, got involved in being a part-time engineer. and. Uh, you know, it was, um, I, I participated on most of the, the atmospheric shots, probably being between six and 10 miles away. Mm -hmm. And uh, very interesting. Um, uh, as I say, I, I, the first trip I was out, I was out there for s six months mm -hmm. without coming in. And then I came back to Vegas for a couple of weeks and then I went back out again. Yeah. And uh, I got involved in, Plum Bob at the test site in 57. Uh, I got to see most of the events at Plum Bob here at, at the Nevada test site. Okay. And, uh, and then I went back out there and we talked. And as I mentioned to you earlier, go ahead, you got a question. Yeah, I got a question. Yeah. Um, okay, so you take, you're, you're cleaning these islands. Before you started, mm -hmm. can you tell me sort of what, like the background radiation level, you know, just sort of a, use your hands or something. No, but I have no yeah, idea. If you got through, it was better, obviously. Yeah. How much better? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Um, the, the Defense Nuclear Agency guys, they had these um, uh, little tracked vehicles. In fact, the little computer I told you about was inside of them. And they had a Geiger Miller tube hanging off the back that was about yay big around and four or five feet high. And they did all the measurement and reporting, and we never asked, and they never shared the data with us. So I don't know. Was the was the plan then that for people to repopulate that area, or is it just like that way? We were told that the expectation was that Runit would never be acceptable, and that every way, every place else, the natives, native people would be allowed to be moved back. Um, but I have since heard that they're keeping them all out. Now, what is it, Japtan? I think the name of the island. Yeah, was Japtan. Down. And I think most of them are staying there, and they, they wander off a little bit, but they don't leave Japtan much. Japtan was just over from Anawitak. That's right. Yeah, that right across yeah. the channel. In fact, Japtan was where we, during my time, 
was where we had uh, the major substations for electricity. Okay. And uh, every now and then, at the very beginning, in 50, I want to say 56, you know, we fired an atmospheric shot, then we, we upset all the MTTL and the electrical substation. Yes. <laughs> now, when, when we were there, they, they worked very hard to make sure we did not interact with the, the, the locals. Um, you know, they stayed on Japtan and we weren't allowed over there, and that was very clear. Now, occasionally the brass would go across, yeah. but they didn't want the troops there because they figured that nothing good could come of it. So we did inter interact with them to some extent when they'd come over to Anawitak, they'd get food and things like that and clothes and that from, from us. Um, but, you know, the, we, did, we just didn't have much interaction with them. Yeah. yeah. I'd rather add things to it as you speak instead of me probably getting up there in front of you speaking. Please. Myself. But the people from Japtan that I saw, I'm a member of the uh, Forward Advance Party, 15 May 77, probably seven and third person that stepped on the lower truck. Mm -hmm. I missed the, the boat trips back before we had our laundry service and everything else going on. And had to get the chopper ready. Right. Mm -hmm. Back to Lodua, and I had a drop off in Runa of some supplies of people mm -hmm. who earned their finances. But what I'm getting to in Jap 10 is when I seen the locals come in that they had separated us from, I don't know, probably something like five guys. A couple of them had a big old goiters on their neck. Wow. Um, apparently, they didn't want us to see whatever it was. I mean, I've been stuck with this stuff for 38 years of research and everything. Question too much about anything. Mm -hmm. the identiform babies, the mole babies, DNA damage, you go on and on. I can, I'm not probably just going to ramble if I get up there. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, that, that is one interesting thing. I've told a couple of people here. I graduated ROTC in 76, and one of my classmates went into to Chemical Corp. And I lost track of him. We finally got together about two years ago and found out that he was in the advance party to do the safety procedures for Mike Brown. He would have been a first lieutenant at the time. Um, he's, yeah, he's a little distinctive looking because his mother was, was Asian, and so he's, he's a very tall, good-looking Asian guy. So, you know, so he's a little distinctive in that way. So, you know, I don't know if you saw him. But, you know, he's sitting at dinner at my house, and you know, we got talking about what you do in the army. And I told him that we talk, and he told me his story. And he said, "Just curiously, what were your safety procedures?" And I said, "Well, whenever we'd cross across into the hot zone, we had to wear these rubber boots that were taped shut with masking tape, and we wore a painter's mask." And he stopped, and he sort of said, "Okay, why'd you wear the painter's mask? Why didn't you use a rebreather system or some, you know, a forced air system?" Well, that's what they told us to do. And he said, so there's, there's partic particulates in the air, and you wore a painter's mask that, like, things can get around? <laughs> well, yeah. And he says, okay, and why'd you wear the boots? And he said, well, uh, you know, he said, weren't you working in the, in the soil? And wasn't the soil all around you? And you get it on your arms and your legs and your body. Why'd you wear the boots? And, <laughs> and so he, he's like, I don't know. That, your procedures were nowhere near what we recommended. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> what do you say at that point, you know? Um. Well, it's my understanding that Bikini and I tried to in inquire in this a couple months ago. Um, I understand there's a, just a handful of people at Bikini, mm -hmm. and uh, I understand there's not very many down at, at Anna We Talk. Um, at least that's what I was kind of advised. Well, there, there's some, a village there full of people on Japtan. In fact, a group of us have gotten together. The way I found out about this thing is through Facebook. That yeah. One of the guys is really active at it. And one of the girls in the group was a little girl on Japtan when we were there. And okay. she's now a 30-year-old yeah, living didn't in inquire. Oregon. I didn't inquire about Japtan because I didn't realize that because when we were there, we didn't have many people living on Japtan. Okay. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. During the testing, they sent them all away. Yeah. Yes. We evacuated yeah, it in 1946. In. Yeah. yeah, 46. We took them off, took them down to Rongelap, and then when we did Bravo, uh, yeah, Bravo, 
uh, the winds changed after we fired and took some of that radiation in the vicinity of Rongelap. And uh, we shipped a ship down there from the Navy and we evacuated them all. My memory serves me, we took them over to Kwajalein. How, how close was Rongelap there, you know? Rongelap is about 200, 230 miles away. Yeah, Kwaj is pushing 500. Yeah. Yeah, I was flying from Kwajalein over to uh, Anna Weetok on a C-47 one afternoon. We were flying along, <laughs> just doing great, and all of a sudden we just dropped 150 feet. <laughs> God. Yeah. So damn wonder we didn't the the seams in in the C forty seven why some of us didn't get cracked over the head with those. Yeah, flying <laughs> up from Kirtland to test site, you call it the bomb comet. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I most of the time from Anawe I mean from um, Hickam all the way out to Anna Weetok was C one twenty fours. That was a better ride than the C forty seven. Yeah. 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 Now one one thing too, now that you got my memory up here. The chief was a, his name was something like Johannes, and um, they got him a set of fatigues that said U.S. Army and then Johnson for the name tag, and he had to outrank anybody that was on the island. So anytime a general came out, if he was higher ranking, they had to give him another star. <laughs> and I, I think he was a four-star general by the time <laughs> I. <laughs> so, but yeah. And I have to admit, you know, during my time frame out there, we didn't have any natives, see? Mm -hmm. we, because we'd evacuated them all and put them down on Rongelap, and then, of course, we, then they took them over. And you got to admit, that all happened before I got out there because Bravo was February 54, and so I never got to see any, any of the natives to mount anything because, you know, I'm a late comer into the system, and... Uh, you know, they'd been testing from 1946 until uh, 55, and then, yeah. then I came in, got into, uh, let's see, I want to say Red Wing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then they continued to test. I left in February of 58. They continued to test until my memory served me like September or October. They did a hell of a lot of tests while I, after I had left be because that's when the moratorium was coming on. It's supposed to be 43 total tests there? Yeah, and so um, they, there was quite a few tests after I left because I was, yeah. I had the opportunity, I knew I was going to get laid off because we were going into moratorium and a lot of engineers got laid off. But uh, I was a friend of Jim Reeves, the test manager, and uh, so he, uh, and I had worked in, in Albuquerque before for three months and uh, they, Accounting department said, "Yeah, we'll take Ernie Williams." So I went back to the accounting department just to survive and stay on the payroll. And uh, I did almost four years there, and then I came back out and went to Christmas Island. Okay. When, when you mentioned uh, Mike Dagger, I was pretty much a laborer while I was there. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the hotline. Yeah. And I remember there was. The little hut over there where you back in from the hotline and, mm -hmm. and they check you out and you know if you're you know if you've got a nose swipe and all this other stuff and they, that's how they check you out. And I recall that you know there were, it was a chain link fence that was you know bordering the hotline from the cold line, mm -hmm. or the safe line from the dangerous mm -hmm. line. And the the chain link fence went across and then it cut over and then there's where you were, you know, the, the fence where you checked in and out was over this way. Mm -hmm. And I worked on emptying the um, the uh, Portland cement, the 90 pound bags of cement all day long, dumping them in the hopper and it would suck it in a tube, big vacuum over to the hopper. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think about, you know, 40 feet away was this mound of radioactive dirt and pile of stuff and like you say, the shaker and everything. Yeah. And I, I did get to drive the the, um, the bucket loader a couple of times mm -hmm. and that's when you'd suit up. But the only reason we suited up, I mean, we're right on the fence line. We'd suit up because the Portland cement was all over the place. You know, we goggles and yeah. like you say, you're inhaling the, you know, the Portland cement and 120 degrees and 98 degrees humidity, and you're out there for an hour dumping these bags of cement, 
Mm -hmm. And by the time you're done, you're drenched. Your yellow suit is just completely covered with Portland cement, and you're, you're like walking back, uh, get me out of this thing yeah. before it dries, so I don't, you know, I don't turn into a cement pile. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I just recall, you know, and it was it got quite windy out yeah. there too. Yeah, it was you know, constant wind. Yeah, and it, yeah. it would constantly blow, and the you know the dirt would blow yeah. into your face. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're just wondering. Yeah, you, you come in dirty. Yeah. yeah. Like it, you, you probably remember this. You know, we had we had no women on low draw, and so a lot of guys, what they do is is you you have your hooches, and then we had shower building and we had shower trailers, and the guys would go in there and they would take off all their clothes, put on their flip flops, towel in one hand, bar of soap in the other, and just walk to the shower. Well, you know, when I first arrived on that, we talk, it was right at shower time. Now, you imagine getting off this boat and see about 150 naked guys walking around. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh my goodness, what kind of army is this one? And they're all, all striped because you're, you're so tan. Yeah. And you've been wearing your boots, so your feet are white and your butt's white and everything else is brown. <laughs> so. uh -huh. I remember there was one guy, I don't know if he was Army or Air Force, he would jog around the island naked. <laughs> he just liked to be naked. He would just run around the island naked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was 120 degree heat yeah. and 100% relative. Yeah, or virtually Yeah, usually you're just wearing shorts. Yeah. Well, we would had, you know, uh, you got to remember during this time frame of, um, you know, the, I guess I want to say the Vietnam War, and we would, we would get a USO coach. USO, USO show to divert and come into Anna we talk and uh, you know of course we had about you know 2900 of us on the island and uh, you know the, the tour group that say well where are we going to stay tonight and I said when you're finished here you're getting on the airplane and you're going back to Kwajalein. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we had one there. And I think it was like around Christmas or something? Or yeah, it, it was or early in the year or something like that. Oh, yeah. And, and it was like a 10 minute show. Mm -hmm. They came and they started doing their thing and I think somebody jumped on the stage and started dancing and that was it. They shut it down. Yeah. Well, he actually uh, oh, yeah. he, he gave the girl a big kiss was, and really upset oh, her. Well, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, it was the well, one. I, that's why we were you know, I, most, <laughs> most of the time I had most of the homes in our regards. And uh, you know, we got them off the airplane. We took them to the cafeteria, and we centered them off. We had a I don't know, like five or six foot portable mm -hmm. partition, so that the rest of the troops could get around in there. And then they'd do the show. And by 11 o'clock, you were on an airplane, and you're going to Kwajalein. Yeah. <laughs> now you were, you were familiar with all the cooks, right? Yes. The homes of Narva cooks. Big Samoans or, yeah. or Islanders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I got into a problem with one of those cooks one time. Mm -hmm. I guess they were they were situated there, were down at the towards the dock or something. Yeah, they were down toward near like where the officers were. Right. Okay. But they were on the other side of the main road. Okay. So we were we were all out at the outdoor theater one night. Mm -hmm. You know, with our Olympia beer, yeah. watching movies and. I remember this guy, Smitty, he took off to go get more beer. And, and it's like he never came back. And we're like, hey, we need beer, Smitty, where are you? So, you know, we were, we were pretty blitzed. And so we were walking around looking for Smitty. And we kind of got sidetracked and went down the wrong row. And all of a sudden, this guy comes out this door. This big, huge guy. And he's like, what are you doing? You know, he starts yelling at me. And what's the matter with you? And so, you know, he said, come up here, come up here. And so he starts talking to me. And, I just, you know, I was kind cool, just go back to bed. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bother you. And, and he just, one arm, boom, blocked me right in the face. And boom. my face back, and before, before I realized it, I was trying to get him punches, and all of a sudden I hear three more guys running out of the other hooch after me, and I was gone. Yeah. And then the next morning, I go to Chow Hall, and I'm like, oh man, why does my face hurt? I go to Chow Hall, and I stick out my plate, and all of a sudden I look up, and there he is, and I went, oh shit. <laughs> He's like, how much you want? You want more? You want more? <laughs> Whoa. He got his respect. He didn't knock me on my butt, so he was, he was like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. That was, that was crazy low go up. Yeah. Who's number nine? The officers didn't get to see that. So no. You, no. You we, were in a different we, section. You weren't with the animals. You know, when, when you're an officer, and, and any of you guys who, who have been officers, you know that you don't want to put yourself in a position where a drunk enlisted guy could do something that breaks the rules. Unless you're drunk too. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you, you kind of say, look, they're having fun. There's no problems. Let's we'll let them know. They, the last thing they need is one of the officers around them that could, could ruin things. And so we kept ourselves during the party time and, and it, we let them go. Yeah, it usually wasn't the officers. It was the first sergeant or the sergeant major that was acting as a sergeant major that was actually a first sergeant. Mm -hmm. And he would always try to bust everybody's balls. Yeah. And it's, it was just, you know, what, what, give us a break, guy. We're here, mm -hmm. you know, basically slave labor, busting our butts. I, I get the impression when I'm listening to you, General, that this is basically all military people, we, except for Holmes and Arvin. Yes, yeah. all military. All, all the real work was done by military, uh, with a, a few exceptions. Yeah, I didn't we know had, that. On Runit, mm -hmm. we had one contractor who was just this amazing MacGyver-like guy that could fix anything. Oh. Yeah. And um, he, he ran around, he gave him a Jeep, and he put a welding rig in it, and he put some other stuff in it. And anything that we couldn't fix, he fixed. And, but sure. other than that, it was all military. And likewise with um, uh, B Company, they, they were all military. I didn't realize that. Yeah, we had a small detachment of SEALs there that um, they did things like, there were a couple times we had to blast, do some underwater blasting to make, uh, so we could get the boats in. Mm -hmm. And so they pretty much stayed to themselves. They didn't work very hard because there wasn't a lot of need for them. Yeah. Um, and then we had a group of people that ran the generation and water supply. We had a desalinization plant yep. on Lodishwa, sure. and we had a, a power. And um, they pretty much stayed to themselves. And one of the guys, uh, Eldon, I think is his name, who we see him on Facebook, uh, he set that up. And now if any of you look at any of the pictures, you see him, you'll see this um, uh, painting on the side of the generator building it says something like the Lozwa Cat House. And that was because they were Caterpillar engines that powered the generators. <laughs> and so, you know, it said Lozwa Cat House, and then this uh, sexy picture of a girl sitting on a Caterpillar logo. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, so you get Things haven't that. changed any. No. <laughs> uh, there, uh, yes, sir. Bikini, I presume, was cleaned also. I think I saw. And one of our things into the Bravo pit, and the last picture I saw, the Bravo test site was covered with a big concrete dome. I don't know if you ever. I don't know. Be, they did that in Bikini. That sounds like what we did in Anawita. Yeah, that's all. As far as I know, the only dome we have is on, on in Anawita. Yeah. No, I can't. Yeah, I don't know. Can you do these things, maybe Google it or something? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take a look. I, I know that... What happened to the Bravo uh, detonation site on um, Bikini? And also, I did hear this, and again, what you hear may or may not be true, that they've asked me if they wanted to go back, they could go back for a month or two at a time, go for the shipmen to look around, but that's for all the longer they could stay because of background radiation, even though it's been cleaned. Wow. Years later. Well, and I know that people are that that homes and armor built uh, stormproof buildings for the natives on Japan, and in fact, this gal I talked about, who's the 30-year-old, uh, mm -hmm. she said her uncle has a house on the island that's empty, and if anybody wants to go back and visit, they're welcome to use his house. But, um, but yeah, they're they're living there full time and on Japan. Well, did we still have the? Yeah. Another question: Homes and armor. <coughs> Company still in existence? I think so. Homes sure. and Arbor got involved in. Uh, big time. Not, yeah, the Homes and Arbor, are, I think, my memory serves me, uh, really started in 1946. Mm -hmm. well, and I, they I, continued to stay. They were still there when I left. I know they were still there until testing stopped in 58. There was no more testing after well, they, 58. They were there in 80, but I don't know about it. And. Uh, but on the main island where I lived, there was a deep water pier uh, that the ships could come in and, and dock in. Mm -hmm. 
and um, questions. Do you guys want to add anything? I mean, you were there a lot earlier than me. Yeah. Well, if you want to find out more about anything, just Google Cactus Crater Marshall Islands. That's what they named the damn thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you can read all you want about it. I, I feel compelled to look now. <laughs> okay. Uh, what did you do? Call it Cactus what? Cactus Crater. It was a cactus plant. Yeah, okay. Dot com, okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm hard of hearing. Please don't ask any questions right off the bat because I probably won't hear you. I'll start off with, uh, name's Larry Dean Adams, Spec 4, Bravo Company, 84th Engineer, Combat Heavy, Light Construction, Schofield Barracks. Uh, before May 15th, 1977, we got reattached to Fort Shafter. Went from the 25th to like the double C emblem on your seat sleeve. Um, Showing a little film before in our orientation before we went by Mullen P. Perkins, the guy from uh, that old TV show. I can't remember what it was. Marlon, Marlon. Yeah, Marlon. Yeah, yeah. He gave, yeah, gave a little thing and talking about, yeah, well, don't worry about this, don't worry about that. And okay, well, fine. We get to NOE talk, fly in there. Remember that flight well, well. Now that's the first time I've done this, about C-131. Seats are backwards. The cargo nets are in front of me, staring at caskets. Um, land on Inuit Talk Island itself, and I remember the sun being bright as hell. First week, no, actually about the first three days, we got acclimated. Didn't have to do anything, go anywhere. We just got to hang around a bit. And then within the first two weeks, we had started shuttling on one of those boats. I forgot what they called them, LCDs or LCM, 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 whatever they were. I can't LCM. remember what they were called. And we shuttled back and forth to Lojua and, and we talked before we established the base camp. Uh, First got the low jaw, there was brush everywhere. Birds were dive bombing us, the white gannets, sharp beaks. Nothing was decontaminated as far as we knew. Uh, there was nothing there except the, the mess tent over by the causeway. Um, uh, let, let me think back on this. <laughs> we, uh, Excuse me for a second. That's all right. It's okay. I um. Uh, anyways, after we kept on going back and forth, establishing the camp, the only thing that we really saw besides that tent on low there was maybe a few s old slabs of concrete. What they were used for before, I don't know. But as we started making the pads. Uh, we used the sand that was there on the island. After we sifted it through, we had this like 45 de degree angle uh, strainer of some type. You know, the bigger rocks, whatever, got sifted through and we graded all the brush to one side of the island. Some of that got burned later on. Then we dug a deep pit where we used to burn some of our garbage in that. The food scraps that were left over were brought over to the next island that was uh, across the causeway and dumped in the lagoon. And that's when I think you guys started having the rat problems because we didn't have rat problems yet when I was there. There was nothing there, nobody there. It was like stepping into the twilight zone. Stuff on all the, uh, the other islands during the you know, transition from trip to trip it was from World War II or from the testing days still. Nothing had been touched. Uh, landing craft, you name it, rusted out stuff. You got up close to it, you could take the cowrie shells right off of the side of the metal, stuff that was above water grade. Uh, didn't know what anything was, contaminated, nothing. There's no briefing. We were all in the, the stage of developing and learning what to do, the protocol. We get, we're given a, a film badge 
that we buttoned to our shirt. And we wore it for about the first two weeks. And then they told us they didn't work. Didn't tell us why they didn't work, what they mean by not working. Didn't register, didn't, didn't do the gamma, beta, x-ray, whatever. They didn't give us anything. They just didn't give us anything new after that. And the stories I'm hearing about you with the nasal swipes and the other ones I've read about with the, uh, the urine in the gallon bottles, we didn't do any of that stuff. They, they hadn't developed any, any of that stuff with us yet. We, we were the guinea pigs before anybody has even called the Lodra animal. Now, I, I, here's one funny story I can have, and I don't have any funny stories really, but on August, August 11th, I remember, no, no, on June 11th, on June 11th after being there, since May 15th, we had a full bird colonel come to uh, Lower Georgia just to see how the progress is going on. And he was wearing a khaki uniform with shorts. And we were all still wearing our jungle fatigues and that, and um, down to the t-shirts and boots and all that. And the next day, we, we had just set up our tent to stay in, but we we're still transitioning back to Inuitak to do our showering. So before that, we we're bathing in the lagoon in Lodua, and that's when I discovered that bar soap doesn't lather in salt water. It just gets greasy. You get it on you, and you can't get it off. You say, what, 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 am, I, what am I doing? I'm, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm taking a bath and radiated everything, no matter where you look and where you, you just, it's enough to drive a person nuts. It drove me nuts. I got my sanity when, uh, well, I'm, I'm jumping around here. Let me get back to the June 11th story with the full bird colonel in the shorts. The following day, when, we got, when I got back to, uh, and then we talked, I took my dress khakis. We had the short sleeve khakis, you know, the, the tan things, and the long sleeve pants. I cut those into shorts. Cut them into shorts and I took the time to put like a two inch hem on them. Came out to the morning formation before the boat trip. Platoon sergeant, I was in a B company, second platoon, platoon sergeant named Posey told me, go change into a regular uniform, which is the khakis. And I told him, no, I just saw a full bird with the uh, shorts on. He said, well, you're disobeying a direct order then, you know. No, I'm wearing shorts because it's freaking hot here, and a full bird has been wearing it. Get back to uh, Lodger and I got an Article 15 waiting for me. Ooh. Okay, I don't, know if, I don't know, I bet everybody in there probably knows that, I that is. It wasn't Article 15 for, for court martial, it was Article 15 for whatever, something lesser it was, disobeying an order. Yeah. Um, and I seen that full bird again after I had already confronted my, uh, my captain, the CO, it was uh, Timothy Wood. Uh, and he gave me my, my paperwork asking what was up, and I said, oh, here it is. And I wore that same uniform, the shorts, to the hearing. So this is what I'm wearing. And they told me, well, you know, it's really not the shorts, it's just that you cut them too short. Oh, then tell me where and how, and I, they're trying to back out of it, like I shouldn't be wearing that. And from then on, everybody started wearing shorts. So I don't know if I'm the first one, and I hear all these guys, and I see the, the footage I followed and the, and the writings where everybody got the low joy animals and that. I'm gonna look at myself and identify myself as being the Neanderthal first guy that did that shit. And it's, uh, I got like four Article 15s while I was there, and I, I beat every one of those raps. It was just for stupid ass shit. But then uh, we even had one guy before the first month was over, I'm not gonna mention his last name, his first name was Jack. He wanted to get the hell out of there, drove him nuts, he wanted to commit suicide. He, uh, he, he, he climbed up the water tower in, in a wee duck island threatened to jump. They wouldn't send him back to Hawaii. <laughs> Very good friend of mine. Well, they talked him down. They shipped him out. He went back to Schofield. He got a local discharge, and I took a local discharge. 
they didn't discharge him in medical. I don't know how he made it through, but it's, uh, he was so close to being you know, discharged that they, I think they just let it ride. And I had, before I went there, I had hopes of maybe wanting to be an oceanographer. Yeah, I was all shattered after, after uh, Marshall Islands. I took the local discharge there, and I stayed for another six months in Hawaii. And I didn't want anything more to do with water, islands. I used to love surfing prior to that. Uh, getting back to low draw now. The way the base camp started, use the sand that was there, had the the mason guy build the forms for the pads, and we used to have to drive a, a bucket loader down to the lagoon where those little LC, whatever, used to land at that pier, right. drive down there and scoop up a bucket of lagoon water, drive it back to the one concrete truck that we had. It was so old and outdated and broken down, and it only had one direction. I can't remember if it was forward or reverse, but it was only one direction. We brought the bucket loader up to the top, level with the concrete truck, filled up five-gallon plastic pails, poured it in, and we made the concrete. And then our uh, earth grader had to pull or push, I can't remember. We had to pull that concrete maker back out to the next pad. And successfully, we poured, I don't know how many pads, probably 10 of them before we very first uh, prefab building went up. The prefabs were made on, uh, in a wee talk and they were shipped to us already. First one that uh, we built, or I built, I think it was maybe a five-man crew of those huts that you guys ended up living in. Took, took us about a week to do the first one. I think we had three crews maybe. And it became a competition to see who could build uh, the fastest one after that. By the second one being built, we had it done and over in three days. You know, it was our entertainment of a you know, 12-hour, 16-hour day, whatever it was. You know, it was something to do, and it became competition. That was the fun part, if anything. I mean, we learned all kinds of tricks and improvised all kinds of different ways to make that. Beer cans for hinges and, uh, and whatever. <laughs> um, got those done. And then my, another Article 15. As I mentioned earlier about missing a boat, and by that time, uh, this sergeant had it in for me, and I know I was supposed to be at the pier at 1 o'clock, and I saw I was there at like 105, doing our own laundry on, on the main island. We didn't have laundry service yet set up. So I ended up getting a helicopter ride, talked to a warrant officer, and he said, yeah, we got a, we got a, uh, we got a Huey, I think it was Huey. They had to make a stop off at it ruin it. And so they already had a trip planned. And they unloaded some wooden crates, and the rotors kept on going. Uh, handed off some crates to guys in banana suits. And I'm choking. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm choking my ass off in this, this stuff right here, right? I get. Get back to Loja landing there, and just about that same time, the craft that was ferrying my, my platoon had just arrived on Loja. And it was a rainy, cold day that day. And this was on August 2nd of 77. I got an Article 15 for that one for missing my, my place of duty. They, uh, they dropped that one because I ended up getting back there and I had enough brains to not just be abandoning in my post, and I made it back to where I needed to be. My punishment for that was building me and another guy, the infamous 12-man shitter. So if they still had that years later, I don't know, was it a, I built a 12-man wooden construction with a lean-to one top, one side, okay. That might have been there, yeah. So I don't know what you guys, we didn't have a porter party, we didn't have none of that stuff. But as a, when I, that was my punishment in building that. I said, oh, fine, you know, I'll, just, I'll do this. And I'll work by myself with me and a buddy. And uh, I got back at them. My buddy built on one side his six you know, stalls. And I built my six in my stall. And I put up a partition of a couple of two by fours, two by, two by, four by eight panels, pieces of paneling, for a little divide. And all the holes that I cut out for the toilet seats, which underneath there was 55 gallon drums were, you know, we put diesel fuel on there and 
you know, just stir it up, your witch's brew, and, and burn this stuff up. But I took all those cutouts, and I drew faces on them. Faces that look like the captain, that look like a platoon sergeant, look like somebody, and the captain, Timothy Wood, I called him Timmy. Posey, I called him um, P, you know, you do your imagination. And the building that I built was probably maybe 12 feet high at, at the highest point above the doorway. I had to build a screen door. And I nailed those suckers up there, way up there, so no one could get them. So anytime those guys came in there to, to do their duty, I just stuck it to them once again there. <laughs> We found ways just just to ease our tension. Um, we, we didn't have the bar set up. We didn't have none of the stuff that I read that you you guys all had. I. So what the captain did to force me and this platoon sergeant to get along, he had us go down and set up the batten boards for the desalinization plant with the big diesel engines and the long rectangular white aluminum building. I set up the corner boards for the uh, concrete guys to make the pads. Those engines came in much later. It was right next to the pier where the green uh, water tank was being built. I left, when I left there, there was only one panel off the, uh, the green water tank. There was nothing in it yet. Um, I found solitude in there. I brought my guitar with me. I found solitude by bringing my guitar in there, and I knew in that type, that type of shape, the acoustics would have to be good. And I sat in the middle of that thing by myself. I don't know how many hours I just played. And finally, a, a, a buddy of mine showed up, and they sat there with me, and we just sang and played guitar. And, uh, the acoustics were killer in there. Uh, I see with my other Article 15s. I, don't know, I, I just, by the time I got, by the time I left, I was down to wearing flip flops and shorts, and that was it. And I'm climbing up on a steel framework building that desalinization uh, plant. Uh, did some snorkeling, we did some diving. Never got any warnings to stay away from this island, stay away from that island. Went to a couple islands by myself. Saw some things in there that I remember seeing a, a mortar round in one of the coral on one of the beaches stuck in it. It didn't explode, obviously, but it was stuffed corals going around it. I, I didn't go near it, didn't know it live or whatever. And I started walking through the heart of the island, the palm trees and that stuff. Saw a couple of sake bottles, green bottles, how, how they were there, when they were there, if they floated up during a typhoon or what, but I saw some of that stuff. Then walking through the islands by myself, I can remember the thick, two inch thick black cables that were running between islands. And I could see to the next island, it would disappear into the water. You could swim from island to island to island to island. They're all so frickin' close. But when you go by yourself, I just wanted to be alone a lot. I don't, I don't know why. I, I want, with my buddy a couple of times, but I mostly I just wanted to hang out by myself. Uh, I just got comfort in that. And, uh, and on Lodja, I was talking to one of you guys earlier about Mount Lodja at the sand. Well, originally, that was a concrete bunker. I don't know why they buried it, whether it got a radiation reading on it or what, or, but there was a panel, an empty panel box, metal panel box, still on the inside of the, the bunker. Uh, my experience there wasn't pleasant. I, I'll tell you that. No, we tried to make the best of it, and uh, we did what we did. We were sent to do what we do. But it's uh, got VA help. Um, the thing is, the doctors don't know, don't know how to, to deal with us. No, they, they only know what they know by their books. They don't know how to talk with atomic veterans or anybody with this radiation stuff. I don't go on the record. My damn group, the atomic cleanup veterans, deserve to have atomic veteran status. But that's BS that we don't have that. I mean, it's, not, it's, it's, it's our legacy. 
You know, it's, it's, it's not about getting benefits. It's not about being the, the guinea pig for the radiation registry so they can find out what, what is in us. I decided not to have any kids. I don't know if there's DNA damage or what, but when you don't get answers and you ask questions, what do you do? Never married. Turned several women down, afraid of having children. Justified, I don't know, but I know I decided my generation's gonna end with me if there is anything. I mean, I learned when I was older about the mole babies, and I learned that from those when I, was, I told you earlier about seeing those residents from Japan when they missed a boat in, in the quarters. Yeah, well, I'm being told yeah, it's, it's an iodine deficiency. Now here you're in the middle of the frickin' ocean. You know, how much more salt do you need? And I can talk about cesium-137 or 131 and plutonium and uranium and fission and fusion and A-bomb being the detonator for a hydrogen bomb. I can go on and on and on. And it's just, I'm 100% this freaking disabled. I don't look like it. Probably sound like it, though. But uh, the thing is, it's PTSD. Everybody is fighting for the atomic veteran status. I got 70% PTSD in the remainder of blah, 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 unemployability. I want my brothers here to know you got freaking PTSD, man. And I did not call it and classify myself. I, I, for years I went to the VA for help. I finally went to a social worker because I was getting tired of paying for meds that were doing nothing for me. And I stumbled on an article in the National Geographic magazine, June 1986. Everybody get that and find it. And go to your social worker in your VA clinic, show them that there's a story in there that tells you everything about what we did and where we're going. Are you cutting me off? Uh, I, uh, yeah, we're going to have to close the building, so thank, oh. <laughs> thank you very much, sir. All right, yeah, thank well. And we, we need to think about this. This place. Thank you so much. Okay, this is going to wrap it up. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow.